You may be seated. He has risen. Some are a little quicker to say it than others. He has risen. He has. And that does give us great joy. So what's it like the day after Easter? We're going to talk about that a little this morning. I want to introduce to you a friend. I can call him a friend because it was only a year ago, Dominic, that I met Dominic Palacio. He led the trip to Jackson, Mississippi, the immersion trip. How many of you? Miami, Florida. Let me say that again. He led the trip to Miami, Florida. How many of you have been on that trip to Miami, Florida? Yeah, very good. Hey, I'm just back from vacation. I'm warming up. I'm just getting back into it. Anyway, Dominic led the trip to Miami, and my son Joel Borsma led that trip with you. And so it's been a pleasure to get to know Dominic over this past year, his lovely wife, Kristen. And Dominic is a pastor, associate pastor over at Holland Heights Christian Reformed Church in town. We had the great pleasure to listen as the Lord speaks through Dominic today. Pray with us. Lord, we bless you that you use ordinary people like us to express your extraordinary living word. Thank you that you have called Dominic today to speak to us. And now, Lord, give us good ears to listen and fertile hearts to receive. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you welcome the Immersion Trip non-support student leader from Miami, Florida, <laughs> Dominic Palacio. <laughs> Thank you. I was just called a non-support person. I don't know. Um, Thanks, Paul, for your, your kind words, and thank you, uh, students and Hope College, for having me today. I know it's always a privilege and an honor to share the gospel. And I've also been told that guest speakers are notorious for going long, so let's get started with a reading from God's Word. Today, the Word comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 13 to 21. Hear the Word of the Lord. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover... Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple court, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here and stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews responded to him, by what, author by what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, tear down this temple and I will raise it again in three days. But they replied, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As Paul said, it's the day after Easter. The empty tomb. The resurrection. What one theologian said, calls Easter the hinge on which the entire Christian religion turns. No resurrection. No Christianity. To paraphrase the Apostle Paul, if there is no resurrection, we're all just wasting our time. We are here because the tomb is empty. We are here because the tomb is still empty. It's a big day. And because it's a big day, we have big church services, big music, big sermons. You guys probably experienced this yesterday, right? And probably the thing that, uh, that's the biggest of all, the big meal afterwards. Big Easter meal. Everything's big about Easter. And it should be big because it's a big day. But that was Sunday. Today is Monday, the day after. Our Facebook status has moved from he is risen to I have three tests tomorrow. <laughs> we go back to classes. 
We go back to our regular schedules, and it can sometimes feel like a letdown. So now what? A letdown can happen after a big day. I experience this quite often. I remember this, uh, one example of this is when I graduated from high school. It was a big day. Family drove in from all over the place. It was, our friends took a million pictures with each other. We uh, celebrated. It was, vict it was a day of victory. Freedom, so to speak. Then something odd happened. I woke up the next day and I had absolutely nothing to do. It was the first day since I was five years old that I wasn't either a part of a team or part of some class or had some place to go. Since I was five years old, I had been a student growing up in my hometown. And it just felt kind of empty, a little bit of a letdown. Perhaps you can relate. And Easter can feel the same way if we're not careful. So the main question, the main challenge to us is how do we live into the reality of the resurrection? How do we see the resurrection as not just something that happened 2,000 years ago, which it did happen 2,000 years ago, and we can be sure of that and we can celebrate that, but how do we see it as not just something that happened 2,000 years ago, but that happens every single day? To do what the poet Wendell Berry calls practicing Resurrection. We get a glimpse of what this looks like in our passage this morning. Jesus was in town for, uh, in Jerusalem for the Passover. Passover was one of the appointed times where Jews from all over the world would leave their hometown to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, the main religious center. So it was a busy day. So when Jesus is at the temple, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people going in and out. And Jesus sees something that he doesn't like. He sees, what merchant, he sees some merchants doing what merchants do during the high holidays. He sees them exploiting the people. He sees money changers, and he sees all sorts of economic exploitation. So what Jesus does is he causes a scene. He overturns tables. He makes a whip out of cords. That seems very odd for someone like he, what we would expect Jesus to do. He makes a whip out of cords and he drives the cattle out. He drives the people out. And he rebukes anyone who would make a quick buck peddling religious goods and services. Jesus is not happy. But we see another group emerge. Some, people, some other people are also not happy. But they're not happy with what Jesus just did. It's the Jewish leaders. Why are you upsetting the system? Why are you doing this? Because they were benefiting from this religious system. Why are you doing this? By what authority? Show us a sign and prove it. So Jesus takes a look at the temple. The temple with thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people going in and out. A temple that was gleaming made of gleaming white uh, stone with gold ornaments all over it that took 46 years to build. And he said, tear it down, and in three days I will rebuild it. Little did anyone know that Jesus was not talking about the building, but he was talking about himself. Jesus was talking about the resurrection. John 2 shows us the pattern for practicing resurrection. Jesus says, tear it down, and in three days, I will rebuild something better. For the Jewish authorities, their temple was everything to them. They, they benefited from the system. They loved the temple, and they, could, they were blinded by it. That's why Jesus uses it as an example. Tear it down, and I will rebuild something better. That's the pattern of resurrection, tearing down and building up. So the question we have at how do we practice resurrection is we have to figure out what are those temples in our lives? What are the things that blind us? What are the things that we are obsessed with? What are the things that, quite frankly, just need to be torn down? And I don't know all of you, but what if... Some of the temples in our lives, the things that obsess, we obsess over and the things that blind us is that relationship you're in. And it's not a good one. 
whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship, your friends know it, your parents know it, deep down inside, you know it. But you're afraid of being alone. You're afraid to hurt someone's feelings, so you hold on to it. Or what if it's lifestyle or patterns of behavior and you know it's just not working for you? But you're afraid of not fitting in. You're afraid of not uh, connecting with people. And really, you're afraid to admit that you're out of control. Or maybe it's something good, like good memories of the past. Like me and my letdown after my high school graduation. And maybe college hasn't been a smooth transition for you and you're holding on to the glory days of high school and it's preventing you from really connecting here at Hope. Or now that you're here and you have fully invested, the, the calendar turns to April and you're counting down and you say, I have three more weeks, then exams, then I have to go back home. And you're holding on every second and everything of saying, nothing can be as good as hope. Nothing. You seniors are feeling this too, amen? Amen. Seniors are feeling this. You're like, oh my goodness. I have to start joining this thing called the real world? What am I going to do? Uh, you know, I, I saw at the beginning of the year that, that kind of that beautiful lip dub that all these guys did about there's no place like hope, right? And you're holding on to this, this, this utopia that's Hope College, especially in the spring. It becomes more of a utopia. And you're holding on and you're holding on and you're holding on. Maybe these things resonated with you. Maybe none of them did. But the bottom line is we all have something. Each and every one of us has something that we are holding on to, that we are, that we are being blinded by, regardless of the facts. And see, whether we are confronted with these words or comforted by these words, Jesus comes in and tells us, tear it down, and in three days, I will rebuild it. Tear it down, and I'm going to build something better. Tear it down and I will rebuild it means something that's very hopeful for us. It means that you do not have to hold on to a dysfunctional relationship. It means you do not have to stay in patterns of self-destructive behavior. And it means that you can let go of the glory days. Because tear it down and rebuild it means that our best days are in front of us, not behind us. Our best days are in front of us because the resurrection is true. It's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's something that happens. And the good news is that God is building something beautiful in our midst. I want, I want you to take a look around. I Honestly, I want to see heads on swivels. I want you to look around at the people around you. God is building you into something beautiful. God is building something beautiful out of the students of Hope College. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are in front of you. That is the beauty and the power of the resurrection, is that you are God's beautiful rebuilding project. So students of Hope College, faculty, staff, Jesus comes to us and says, tear it down and I will rebuild it. This is a pattern of resurrection. So as you go from this place, my prayer is that you would go practicing the resurrection in all of its beauty. And as you go, may the grace and peace of the risen Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, be with you. Amen.